I'm the worst at pronouncing any single name on the planet. So I always stumble when we get to this point. So I would like to introduce yourself. So okay, tell me your full name. Okay, my name is Guillermina Benavides. Uh, I work at a univers university. I'm an academic professor at, at the university. I'm, I'm, I work at Tecnológico Monterrey. Uh, that's my background, my, my class background. Uh, Tecnológico Monterrey is one of the biggest university, private university in Mexico. Oh. Uh, we have uh, their Ontario campus uh, nationwide. And I have, we have, since the year 2000, we have a master's degree in a strategic foresight specifically. It was the first uh, master's degree program in, in Latin America that tried to teach uh, foresight and future studies. Um, it, it is now offered in Mexico City and in Monterrey. Monterrey is two hours from the border to, to, to the U.S., so we are really close. I live in Monterrey. I, in my pre-pandemic world, I usually travel to Mexico City once a week or once every 15 days to meet our students there. We have already had 300 graduates from the master's degree program. I thought that's so, how it is. Wow. Yeah, so I kind of do research in futurist studies in diverse topics. I didn't start as a futurist. I didn't picture me as a foresight practitioner or futurist. I just kind of got there uh, by different situations. And yeah, yeah, tell us how you started. What did you study when you were in school? Well, I studied a BA, BA, I think, and international relations. Huh. Then I did a master's degree in public administration and public policy. And after that, I did, I, I, I did a PhD on social work, uh, oh. a dual degree program with the University of Texas at Arlington and, uh, and the a public university here in Mexico, the Universidad Autónoma de Nuevo León. It was a dual degree where I had one year I studied here in Mexico. The second year I went to the U.S. to spend for a year. Uh, um, and then I, I wrote my dissertation and I find, I'm finally uh, finished my Ph.D. And on social work. Uh, I, I was really interested in social policy in, in, in my master's degree and in my PhD, my main focus was social poverty and addressing poverty in Mexico. That what we have had that problem from for many years now when I analyze social programs here in Mexico. But then when I got back to the to academia once I finished my PhD, it was a rather personal situation also because uh, when I finished my studies, I, I, I have a, a, a little interesting thing here. I entered my PhD with no kids. I, newly married, I, I, I had just got married, but I, when I finished my PhD, I ended with four kids, so it was <laughs> kind of crazy, yes, because I had triplets in the, in the my, when I was writing my dissertation, so I had my first kid, and then when, when I finished my two-year courses, two years of studies, and then it was full-time dissertation, you know, so wow. I got pregnant with my first one, and then when he was one year old, I got pregnant again. But this second time around, I, 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 got, I got triplets. So it was crazy, a crazy, crazy. So crazy. I mean, can we just stop and pause for that for a moment? I found it hard just to go from one child to two children. I can't imagine going from one child to four children, right? Because yeah. you still have the first one that you're taking care of at the same time that you're trying to take all the others. And uh, did you then extend your program like or did you try and still do it at the same amount of time not really because i was i was my, my i was due to have my kids on march of that year and i finished my first draft of my dissertation in february of that same year so i was like i was so focused on finishing my dissertation before babies come around well done because, so because if i i was convinced that if I didn't finish before, I will never finish my PhD. So I was like really focused on that. So it was, right, it was a crazy right, right. year, but I was able you take to... A, do you take time off then? Like how much time did you take off before you tried to resume everything? Well, I I didn't really take too time off. I, I Since I was working from home, I was a full-time student, student doing my PhD. I kept working on my dissertation. So after the babies came, there was only like the revisions and corrections and things like that. So I kept kept working on them. I took them in like one one semester 
for finishing after I had my babies in March and I completed all the, I, I graduated from the, from the PhD in October. So on, on December I was, amazing. I finished I like and it was, it was like crazy, but, but we were able to, to, to do that. And after that, I, I took a little bit of time and on March of the, no, on in January of the next year, the university, university invited me to give a class. So I say, okay, yes, I will go back and I'll give one class to see how it goes. And, and I started giving classes on the master's degree in strategic foresight. That, that's how I get to know. Because uh, I usually, uh, um, I, since I studied social work, I usually really, uh, I use qualitative methodologies, focus groups, interviews, uh, observation, and things like that. And many of the foresight methodologies do use uh, yeah. focus group interviews, and you have like these workshops with people. So they needed someone to teach the students how to do this thing. So I, I, this, this was the first time I got like the feeling of what, what it was, a strategic foresight. Oh, yeah, that's that fascinating. Is, yeah. Yes, because all my students were from, from the master's degree on a strategic foresight. So I began talking to them. And after that, I, I began like seeing like, oh, this could be interesting because futures, one of the things I really love about foresight and future studies is the multidisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity of the, of the, of the discipline. I mean, you can apply foresight to anything. So, and, and, and the other thing that, 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 that it's really interesting, it's that you really need to think about the future and we are not really used to do that. We are li always look to the past and have like a very short term framework for taking decision and foresight force you to think about the future although there's it's really difficult to do that because you have to imagine many things because you lack of information that there's no information that there's no data and and i know it really i really became interested in, in what it, your force and future studies was so can i ask you so, a question that i hope is not insensitive because i really i'm asking this very very sincerely but years ago i met like over two decades ago, I, you know, I was in Los Angeles and at the time I was working in advertising um, and there was someone from the Hispanic, whatever, whatever the, 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 the group that organized um, Hispanic advertising professionals at the time. And he gave a really insightful talk. And I remember carrying certain things really that there's a cultural piece to this when we talk about the future, um, about how we interpret the future, right? In the U S we are very more futurist, more future was we um, looking ahead, right? We think a lot about what's going to happen next. And the way he explained it, and I don't know if this is right or not, but it, it felt right at the time, that in Latin cultures, there is much more of a looking back, right? There is a much more of a fate has a role in this, and ancestors play a huge role in this. And um, there is much less of this looking forward, which has impact on things like saving money or thinking about college or thinking even about you know, health and wellness and what it means long-term if we continue these behaviors. Like it was just, was a really, um, it was hugely insightful for me to consider the fact that how we look at time uh, is a really interesting thing when you start thinking about the future and future oriented activities. So my understanding accurate? Yes. I mean, Latin American countries are living, living the now. I, I, that's how, how I understand our culture. So it's one of the biggest problems because we are usually, when, when we are designing public policy, you usually see on what have worked in the past or where, what, which policy worked elsewhere, not necessarily in Mexico. So we just try to copy and implement here. So we do not take the time to get to know the problem, to talk to the community and to plan ahead and not on the short term, but on the long term. So it's really hard. And also it's a problem of faith. You know, we have a strong faith, religious country. And and, 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 and that is many, it's a deterministic way of understanding the future. So it's right. not, it, we, we have that problem. So it's also yeah, it's it's a combination of whether or not we think, well, Sorry, I was going to interrupt. I was going to say, I think it's fascinating to see whether or not we think we can impact or not impact the future. Right, that sense of agency that comes with thinking that you have an impact on it. So I, I found that really, that must be really, really fascinating for the work that you do. 
Yeah, so I mean, you, you, we usually face resistance, and, and for our students, is is we have a, a word in Mexico that is a, a deviation of a word we have is ahora, you know, it's now. We have a, a word that we usually use that is ahorita, and ahorita, we don't know when is ahorita, it's ahorita right. it's now <laughs> or later than now, so it's, it's, I've read some pieces that that said that languages also affect our conception of time. And the Spanish language is strongly focused on the present and on the now. So it's kind of difficult to switch this, this, this mindset of people to force them to look ahead. And even if you do that, they don't have the abilities or the competencies to systematically think right. about the future. So you have to try to develop these competencies. And even in, in, in big organizations, their scope of long range is five years in the future, and that's very long, you know? And, and, and right. when, when you, you go to other places and, and see other cultures, you know that long, long term is 50, 100 years in the future. So our long term here is really, really, really short term. So it's interesting, yeah, we had a conversation with um, Ida Holt from Sweden, who was a, a global foresight lead for IKEA. And she talked about the CEO there having a 400-year version vision, right? They think about where's the world going to be 400 years from now, and they backcast where it is that they want to play and how they want to play. So it is, it's really fascinating to see. And that's what we see, actually, so much of the breakthrough that's happening around the world out of Sweden. Someone once commented in one of my talks, I had three examples from Sweden, I didn't even realize it. But there was, like, all these places where they were innovating and pioneering and thinking about sustainability or thinking about equity and, and really uh, and robotics and so many other things in different ways. And so I do think that that perspective really makes a really big difference in what we produce. And also incentives. You know, we, we have a, a, a government system that prioritizes our six-year periods of, of planning ahead. So we are we are usually thinking on, we have no reelection on, on, on the first level of government of the president. So every, every six years we change and we Every new government that enter, everything change. Every all the the public policy of the last government is garbage. So you have to do something new, and you restart everything. So it's 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 kind of difficult to plan ahead if you have these political cycles that every every six years you have to change everything. So the incentive, incentives are not right, and the culture doesn't help us. I mean. I love Mexican cultures and I love many things about Amer Latin America in, in general, but we sh one of the, our biggest problems is we, we should start thinking on the futures, on the possible futures, and, and, and that, that's, it's a big challenge for, for us, but I, I we have totally to start doing it. That. Well, so then this program it continues to grow though, with strategic foresight. People are you're graduating more and more people who will go out into the work and do this. Well, yes. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, but they face one of... Uh, recently, we make a, a, a program at the program evaluation, and we, we reach out to all, all, some of our graduates. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. Graduates. Where are they now? Yeah. Yes. So they usually go go really well. They, 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 they have very good professional lives. But one of them, some of them tell me that, that, that although they apply a strategic foresight thinking and futures thinking to everything they do, they usually have a hard time to explain to people what it is and why is it, it is useful. So it's a still a challenge. I mean, they, they use it, they apply it, they say they, they, it's really useful for them, but they still face resistance, you know? So Yeah, I can see that. I mean, I, I don't know. Again, I've been doing this work for a really long time, and I did not come at it as a trained professional. I really just come at it intuitively. Uh, and then we, we're seeing sort of these two... Um, different paths. One is very highly academic and lots of people have studied. I didn't even know future studies existed. Um, and those of us who sort of have found our way there just because curiosity has led us to the fact that you have to be able to solve for now, you need to be thinking about where we're heading next as we get very curious about where things are headed and, and have a, an ability to, to knit that together. Um, but in certainly my work over the you know, decades, it's really hard to explain to people why it's important I, or for them to believe it. I think that's the struggle I'm having now. Um, it's less about the fact that people don't recognize that's important, but even still when you lay out what the possible futures could look like, the resistance that comes in and just believing that that's, you know, that we could take such a giant shift or this could have such a huge impact or this could be something that we do need to worry about. 
Um, and so it gets validated, you know, when people realize, oh, you know, every few years I get one of those, oh, this is what you were talking about. And I do think that's been um, the biggest gift, if you want to call it that, through such a tremendously disruptive year, is that people have now started uh, recognizing how important it is that we look forward and that these things can come out of the blue, right? This was not uh, not predicted. It was predicted, and everyone chose not to believe it. Um, and so now I think there is more attention to the work. Are you seeing that in the work that you guys are doing? Yes and no, because every, everyone is talking about the new normal, and, and I'm not sure we understand what is the new normal. I think that many of us just want to go back to things, to how the things were before the pandemic. I don't think that that is going to happen. Or, or um, in the short term, I, I don't think that it's going to happen. I mean, in Mexico, we have had a huge impact. We have, I have been homeschooling and homeworking for a year now. We haven't gone a, a, anywhere. So uh, the vaccination rate in a developing country is going in, in, in much, much more slower pace than, than other parts of the world. So maybe in the U.S. I was reading articles and maybe you go back to the free normal around September, October. Maybe that's that the, 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 the forecast. I don't know if that's true. But here we don't really know because we are still like seeing how, when will people get vaccinated? And if they get vaccinated, then what are the next steps? When are the kids are going back to school? When are going when we are going to go back to the university to, go, to give classes. So these are big questions that we don't know uh, what, 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 what the next year will look like, what, what we will be doing at the end of the year. Well, so, yeah, and I think there's a certain amount of, because I, we also have not been working from home, right? As you know this, as I mean, you've been studying, but we've been lifing from home. So at the same time we're trying to work from home, quote unquote, we're also schooling from home and medicine and virtual traveling and watching movies yeah. and trying to figure out everything we everything. can do from here. So it is not the right, it's not the, I, I just, I, I push back against work from home thing and whether that's working or not working, recognizing all these other um, places that are taking our attention and, and needs that we have. Um, but I do think this question about what does normal look like and what is what do we like about normal, what we don't like about normal. I've been talking a lot about building a better next because there are a lot of things that were broken about the way things were. And if this gives us an opportunity to rethink and, and reshape and rebuild that, that seems to me a, a big opportunity we do not want to waste um, going back. In. And, and then even if we wanted to go back and rebuild it, here's the fallacy right? Even if we want to go reconstruct where it was 18 months ago, the fact is the world has moved on. Technology continues to advance. Our cultural understanding and, and appreciation of our sustainability to bias to resilience uh, has all sharpened. And so there isn't the same back anymore. So the question is, how does the next look like? How do we want the next to be? And where does hybrid education, where does remote work, where does are, you know, balance between nature and technology. Like, these are all phenomenally interesting questions that we get to explore moving forward. Uh, so I think that, again, training a lot of people who know how to do that and are more comfortable with ambiguity or comfortable with complexity is a big, big advantage of the program that you are a part of, right? We don't necessarily even know exactly what's going to happen, but we have to be able to live in the, in the comfort of the unknown and see that it's a good thing. Yeah, and that's that's one of the uh, I, one of the things I tell the, the, the people that are interested in interested study problem is as you said, like if there's a time to study foresight is right now because the pandemic show us showed us that everything can can change and we have been trying to change many things because we are facing if if we talk before the pandemic we have we have been facing many problems, like government, the, the loss of faith in democracy, the, the institutional crisis, uh, climate change. I mean, climate, climate change it's, it's a big problem that we don't know how to address and how will people take it seriously, you know, because everyone thinks and talks about climate change, but they don't, we do not, and, and I, I include myself, we do not take action, like really do change our, ba our, our way of living, of doing and of traveling, of doing so many things that we, we used to do. So, yeah. So what is the, do you know what the average age is in Mexico compared to the United States? Uh, we have, uh, right now, we have like a, a, a 
how it, they call it that in Mexico, bono demográfico, like a demographic bonus, like we have more young people right now, but the, the pyramid is inverting, like many countries. I think that, well, like in 50 years from now, we have more, uh, and, and one of the biggest problems we have is our, our, our people is, we have, we are number one in obesity, well, no, number two, on child obesity, we have a, a big problem of obesity and, and overweight. That so that brings many other problems, health problems like uh, uh, diabetes and, and no, everything. I mean, even like schooling, you know, there was a, because we have, we're trending in that same direction, right? We are at one point by mm -hmm. 2030 or whatever, 50% of our, today's youth will be obese when they're adults, which is just, I mean, like a number that we don't even spend enough time talking about anymore because we have all these other crises that are, have our attention. Um, but it is a humongous one. And there was actually even some research I saw that, you know, the children who are obese end up missing a year of school. So it has so many productivity flags that continue to pile on top of this problem. So, good point. Because I was thinking, on the one hand, you've got this, you do have this youth advantage in the sense that they are, you know, mm -hmm. at least here in the U.S. thinking a lot more about sustainability and about regenerative systems and about trying to figure out how to solve some of these problems. Um, but I'm wondering there if you have some of that same, because that, 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 that is some wind beneath our sails right now. I do think that that group is putting a lot of pressure on uh, the, those over 30 to make better decisions. Mm -hmm. And it's really, really interesting to see in elections moving, you know, in the next uh, 5, 10, 15 years, how that impacts, actually, who is in governance. Yeah, hopefully. We, the thing is that, for at least in Mexico, the millennials are also facing a, a crisis. Like, what I've seen or what, what, they, what some of my studies, students tell me is that at my, at my age, I was already, I, I was able to, or for example, to buy a car or to have a good job. But now they don't get to do that because salaries are lower and and, and, and life is uh, more expensive. So they don't get the same for what they are doing. So right. the economic yeah, model that... that, that too, right? So, it, so, it, so it, tell it, me about your research. Sorry. Oh, sorry, I keep cutting you off because I'm sorry. Tell no, me. no, tell me. Well, it says when I was researching you, I was excited about the work that you had done on uh, work and family in 2040 and some of the scenarios. Oh, yeah. The dead. Um, so I just sort of stumbled upon that as I was, I don't know if that's, you know, in your head currently or, or work that you're still pursuing, but um, I'm fascinated to see, this was pre-pandemic you did that work, right? Or you did it? Yeah, it was pre-pandemic, yeah. Um, it so, was a couple of years ago. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Um so in terms of what you learned through that, or what the, I guess the purpose of it was, right, is to recognize, again, the relationship inside families that are shifting or not. I guess the way I was reading it is that systems are changing inside families, but the systems around us that hold us are not shifting to keep up with that and creating this mm -hmm. you know, greater, greater pressure, which we're seeing everywhere. Mm -hmm. but. Yeah, I, I, I was really interested in the role of women and in, in this balance inside the family and how we have... The, the opportunity to go out and work and and do all these things that 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 men usually do do you know? and, and this was an interest because you know my life situation so I I, I got with four kids I I went back to your to work so I, we were talking I was talking to with, with with one of my colleagues and we were really interested because she was facing the same problem of the same situation so we would we, we were really interested in study if the, this was only a problem for me and it was like this how this move and, and in this group of people that have some like if you if you saw the the, 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 the research it was not the people that were in, in the, the the higher levels of the organization not the lower like where, where you have to work go to work in the factory that's a completely different situation. So it, it, this is people that have an education that can work for home, that can like have more 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 possibility to negotiate with, with their company. So this this woman, they usually what do they face when when the, when they arrive to this situation? What they decide to go back to work, have a family, and try to combine those these these two worlds. So. 
you find we find many different things. We found out that many women it depends on on how money how much money do you make to have the, the, the power to negotiate inside your family. So if your income is just for your things or I don't know, like uh, uh, it, it represents like ten percent of the family income. Your power, power to negotiate is much more lower, so you cannot do not demand too much to, to your partner. So it depends in, in in that way, and also the difficulties they face when the, the these policies tries to protect the woman to be able to have a mother's leave and be at home when their kids are born. But our reflection at the end was that this kind of policies do more harm than good to women because they, they reinforce the role of the home woman inside the family. You know, if, if we, we have to address also the men because we are reinforcing the roles. You know, if, if you give the woman only the right to be at home, if you give the woman only the right to be a mom, but the, the men it's still is outside of the equation, uh, equation so you are reinforcing these roles. So we have to change that way of, of, of thinking about public policy, you know, to, to address them not only to the woman, but to the family, to the mom, and to, to the dad, you know. And, and this was also a, a, the result of, of, a, of a research that was done in Canada, that, that it, the, 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 the parental leave was for dad, not for the woman. So... And, and it showed that after spending two months at home, the equilibrium inside the home really do change. So we, if we are thinking long term, if, if we want to switch this cultural predetermined roles of the mom and the dad inside a family, you have to address also these policies to men, not only to women. So it was an interesting and, 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 and this kind of, of situation, because then we advanced to another research that we were thinking about women in academia, you know? Uh, and, and I've read in the situation in the United States is some, somehow similar to a situation in Mexico where too many women enter academia or study PhDs and then enter to, to this tenure track. Uh, well, no, they, they, they compete for these tenure positions inside universities, but it's so hard for them, you know, to, to reach this position. So they ended up quitting. So this, and a similar phenomenon happened in Mexico where you enter to the, to the you begin to do research and you enter the, the, the research systems, the national research system, but then you stay stuck at the lower levels. No, you know, the, 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 the it's not the glass ceiling is here. The, the concept is a sticky floor, you know, you enter to this first a sticky floor, the sticky floor phenomenon uh, on, on gender studies that when you, you enter easily but then you get stuck there and, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then yeah. you go up you know so yeah. that's, that's also happening in academia in the US or, or women end up quitting because it's too hard for them to be able to combine because they have to to arrange who, care the, who, who take care of the kids when they go to conferences and there's there isn't enough support and they usually uh, have to uh, sacrifice some things. So when they get there, they they usually the, 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 the leadership in academia doesn't take. They are not serious enough because they have a family. So right, no, they, totally. they they don't end up quitting. So it's it's an interesting because although there are many policies trying to address this problem. Many of them are doing more harm than good. So. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I think in general, when we look at any of these kinds of systemic changes, right, there was something I was reading, actually, it wasn't Mexico, that was your president, it had to do with climate change and it had to do with um, uh, incentivizing people to build, to, to grow new growth trees. I think it was. And then in doing so, then people were like, great, they were like clear cutting old forests so they would make room for the new because they would be incentivized to grow the new, not realizing that they were incentivizing basically to people to cut the old growth that we didn't want them to cut, right? So you have to be really, really careful um, with these programs and the way people um, read the incentive and how they manage toward the incentive, which I think is fascinating. 
but I think in this whole conversation around unpaid care work, I mean, that's one thing that has become much more um, visible in the pandemic and people are spending a lot more time thinking about. I'm sure you, you know, you've done all the um, uh, ancillary research around it, but that study, again, from Oxfam from many years ago that showed that the economic value of unpaid family mm -hmm. care work, right, $10.8 trillion that just were sort of absorbed. And so I do think even, you know, around the world we're thinking about this, but it's fascinating, again, to see in other countries where, where they call the, you know, sort of the feminist economy or just, I, I don't love that name because I feel like it, then it sort of overcorrects for this. All we're trying to do is make it more fair and equal and recognize that there are these roles that right now are predominantly done by women that are not anywhere considered in economic productivity or economic support. And so they're just some part of creating whatever it is that grows GDP without actually recognizing how it gets done. And I think more visibility into that is hopefully a longstanding byproduct of this moment that we're in. But then we have to figure out the structures that support that. So in academia, it's the tenure track. You know, in technology, it's another thing. In corporate life, it's another thing. And so I was thinking about the other day about why I have such an aversion to early morning meetings. But, you know, 7.30 in the morning meetings immediately presume that you don't have small children that you need to get, you know, fed and to school and to some way that it's somehow somebody else is going to do that, that task. Um, and so I get very angry at my male peers when they continuously have early morning meetings. Uh, so, but it's just, and that seems like such a simple, small thing, but it's a huge thing, right? Yeah. Stress of trying to navigate all that or the afternoon. And, uh, and so again, I, part of my non-traditional path is that I uh, started working four days a week from the moment I had my first of my three children. Um, but I took a pay cut to be able to do that. It wasn't that I just yeah. like more hours in, right? I was trying to figure out a way to balance that out financially. Um, and then there's also, you know, in my world, the, the breadwinner mom, I became the full breadwinner. In my family, and I think we un don't recognize how many women are that in their families uh, across yeah. the world. So there's so many things to fix. So when you think about this, on this, the last thing I was asking, when you look at the horizon, right, and uh, you see uh, where we are now and where it is that we're headed, because I think the, the confluence between future studies and social work or social policy is really extraordinary. Uh, mm -hmm. And we are actually invited, and you will be uh, joining us, I'm hopefully one of these times, to the USC School of Social Work every year or every semester when they um, finish the program with their doctoral students. Um, the woman who runs the program is a good friend of mine, and she brings in people who think about the future and talk about the future uh, to help set context for the students as they're about to launch into the world. And we've now um, done it with through the Fem Future Society each time. I think we've done now five or six semesters where we bring three or four futurists together and have this conversation with the students. So it's, and it's really designed to show how important social work is in this work that everybody else is also trying to do. So the fact that you've already cracked that, uh, you're far ahead of where these students are, are trying to head to. And so they would love to hear from you um, when we've got that time. But when you have that outlook, um, the question I guess is, as you look over the course of the next 20 years, what are some of the key policies that you're advocating for or that you think that we should pay more attention to, whether it's in Mexico or around the world, but that you think would actually make a really big difference in, um, in wherever the area is? It's not just, I think, in, in economic policy, right? I think you could talk about it for sustainability. You can talk about it through um, the fair use of technology and accessibility to all that. But where are some of the areas that you're interested in and what do you think we um, aren't paying enough attention to? Well, I think that the, 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 the men involvement in all this discussion is important and not only as, as supporting this, 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 this discourse of, of this dominant discourse of giving women spaces, but to, to assuming that they also have to change the role that they, they usually have. I think that's one of the, and, and, and there's so much resistance to do this. You know, like like they, they don't want to do it, and I understand why because they they have been in this position and and, and and it works. But I think they they have many many things also to gain. You know, like like what I what I've seen in it as a result of this research is that when they spend time with the family, they don't want to they don't want to go back to to be this this full breadwinner year because they really enjoy being with that with the with the family you know so they they have to 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 have more involvement and also for me i don't know i don't know i i i, I do not consider my, myself a feminist I, I i'm a woman that's it and and i have two girls i just want want them the, to give them the possibility to choose you know if they want to be a full-time mom and stay at home mom 
they they are able to do that and if they they want to go ahead write professional careers they are able to to, to do that and and do not face this kind of, of criticism in either way you know it, it, it's it, we are free to do what we want to do and and, and that thing that that's that's the more the more important thing because because I I, I I don't know if in the US is happening but there's also this polarization between women like the one that that support yeah. feminist movement and the ones that I, I think that one of the we, we should it's it's a dialogue you know we have the, the tolerance dialogue and 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 and, and I said that we all think different so and, and that's I so think that I would like to say that I think it's gotten better here because I think that you know when I was raising my children that was definitely much more of a uh, a louder conversation I think at the end I think hopefully that this past year we've created just a lot more empathy for both sides and recognizing how exactly it all the way around um, but the thing I was going to ask you about for your family is you talk about for the girls do you want that same opportunity for the boys because what if the boys choose not to become these you know high powered career or academic people and would like to be able to step back how does that work well that's an interesting question I mean if, if as long as you are able to provide for yourself uh whatever works for you you know uh i, I don't want to I, I i mean i don't want this this i i i want to to for them to have the liberty to have but but most of all to to feel good about themselves and to do what's what's right i don't know what is right but but in their value scale how how they go around their life to 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 I, and this reminds me to, to this idea that future is future is uh, it's value laden you know that 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 you try to fit this big world problems and and I think that if you have that empathy that that sits in to, to that's important thing for them to to live with that you know however they decide to live I mean that that's that's their their but I do think that to your point, so the parts that our values are a big part of that, right? This understanding cultural norms are a big part of that and how we define what success looks like and who's really, you know, responsible and not responsible. But I think that the biggest, um, one of the two of the big shifts actually, one is um, the, the role that technology will play. I talk a lot about the fact that we're heading toward a productivity revolution that will mm -hmm. enable many of us to redefine what work looks like and how much effort we put in to be able to you know, um, attain whatever that level of quality of life is that we want. And that I think will be a really big disruptor for this thing that we're discussing here. Because you talk about how millennials are struggling to be able to buy a house or buy a car or save money at the same time that we're saying that we're trying to figure out how to work out all these, you know, role balances. And so I think that if we can relieve some of the economic pressure on that and make productivity more available, then that hopefully then opens up more pathways. And then we have to deal with from a values perspective, but at least that's part of the equation has been um, con contained or considered as we move forward. So I'm, I'm actually very hopeful that that actually helps part of it. Um, and then are you familiar with Rianne Eisler's work? Rianne Eisler? It's R-I-A-N-E. So anyone who's been listening to me in podcasts or listening to these interviews will know that I, I probably reference Rianne every third one <laughs> because it's so relevant to all this work. So when we... Um, Circle back uh, uh, offline. I will, uh, Emma and I will send you some information about Rayon's work because she is very much, but she's in her late 80s now, been pioneering this thinking for decades, has written many, many, many books about it, um, and is, uh, you can imagine a world of socioeconomic um, structure that is called partnerism or partnership systems, um, in which it is much more balanced. And if you go back through the course of time, uh, that it was. Right. She writes many, many, um, she's written so much extensively about the fact that in, the, in history, there was this equal partnership between women and men. And that she describes it as we took a 10,000 year detour into this domination okay. paradigm where it became that male values and, and male structures uh, dominated quite strongly, starting from the home. And she's very much about it. it starts at home and then it goes all the way through society. So this connection that you're making between how we set things up at home, even how we um, punish or not our children or discipline our children um, all the way up through how we build these big, huge uh, socioeconomic policies and structures are all united. And I think you'd find her work really, really fascinating and very hopeful 
And I think that she's encouraged right now that there is more and more conversation happening about how we address these things from a, um, a much bigger systemic place. Yeah. So there's hope. There's hope. Well, how old are your children yeah. now? Uh, the, the, my older one is 11 and the two kids are nine. So and when you think about the world that they're going to inhabit, what are some of the key things that you and this, this again, brilliant confluence of futurist and teacher and social policy person uh, wants to make sure that they understand about the future? Well, I, I want to make them to part of me is excited, you know, like it, it, it's a there's a, a, a big post the possibilities out there, but part of me, it's also kind of afraid of what's coming, you know, because climate change, I mean, this, 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 if, if we do not take action right now, if we don't fix it, if we don't take the opportunity this pandemic gave us to change, well, maybe this is our last chance, you know, that, that's one of the things. And the other is technology, like uh, we, are, we are talking too much about the impact of technology and some authors talk about singularity and you know that this next human leap with where and what will that mean and 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 when you think about automation so we are not going to work anymore or we do not need to work anymore taking it to extreme to other extreme you know so what were we are going to do and 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 there's so many opportunities but if if we don't do what we are supposed to do we can also face some some non desirable future, you know. So so, I think that that and and, and then the thing that worries me most is that we do not really, even this resistance to think about the futures. So we're adopting so many technology that have so much potential, but if we don't do it right, it's. It's also a great risk, you know. I like, totally could not agree more with you on that. One. So, in a way, I'm excited, but in another, in 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 in, in most, uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm also scared of what's coming. You know, I, I don't. Well, I mean, I think that's really fair, right? I think it's also especially interesting when you talk to or psych professionals and futurists who spend a lot of time doing scenario planning and scenario development because I spent a little less time thinking about the dark I mean I do spend time thinking about the dark but not like in the actual full-blown story that you and your students create uh, so I don't have it quite as visualized but I definitely can see and I and I'm a huge advocate again for the fact that we will have these responsibilities or these this, this power this, this potency and it needs to be stewarded thoughtfully and so it goes back to all the pieces that we started out in this conversation about how to build these um, societal understandings and, and priorities in a way that we are taking uh, those technologies forward, that we can feel good about them 100 years from now, or 200 years from now, or 50 years from now. Uh, so definitely, uh, I think we need to think that. I think we just have some choices, and I, part of what I'm trying to help people see is that we have big, important choices to make right now, and they will have long-term impacts on what it is that we, what the world looks like for us and for our kids, and for their kids. And so to take responsibility for those choices now is really the, the work of this generation that we are really like privileged to be in what an extraordinary moment. And so I am trying to help grow my children to be um, comfortable with that responsibility and know what right looks like, right? Putting humans at the center, putting nature at the center, putting um, more collective good and individual good uh, as part of the work that we need to do. So the hope is that we, you know, what I love so much about this work uh, and meeting you all is we get to meet the parents and those who are influencing young people and sharing with them this perspective. It gives me tremendous hope that we are raising a, a generation of, of really, really thoughtful, caring, responsible, smart, confident people. Yeah, so, hopefully, yes. There, there can, uh, <laughs> well, I've included all the students that you teach, so I think it's great. It's not just the ones at home, it's also the ones that are lucky enough to have you in their program. So. Um, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. It's always, again, fascinating for me to compare and contrast across the world how uh, these things are advancing and how we can learn from one another. And, um, you know, Emma and I keep fantasizing that at some point we're going to have a gathering of everyone, but now I'm actually even more excited about the international perspective of that. 
like I think at first I was like, oh, just get people together here and have wine and go on a retreat. But now I'm thinking I would love to do to Ida and Sweden and Samar and London slash Lebanon and Geshe from South Africa because uh, and Zahara. I mean, there's just there's amazing work being done around the world, and I think being able to compare and learn from each other would be really fascinating. So, on our list of things to create. Emma, if she's listening, will be a global summit of extraordinary foresight professionals. So stay tuned. Sure. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. It was a great conversation. Oh, uh, it's so much fun. Thank you. And we will circle back. You are part of our world now, so we don't let go. <laughs> we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you.